Hello, everyone. I'm Thane Rosenbaum, the Creative Director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo University, and welcome to the Folks Conversation Series tonight. Joe Lieberman, four-term senator from Connecticut, former vice presidential candidate from the year 2000. He served the people of Connecticut also as an attorney general, and I think he served a, a, a full decade as a state senator as well in Connecticut. Um, and he has a new book out, The Centrist Solution, How We Can Make Government Work and Make It Work Again. Here it is. It's an incredible book, uh, very well written, and it's really a, a prescription on how to uh, save the government that presently uh, is filled with dysfunction and gridlock. Um, this, is, this concept of bipartisan centrism is something that we've lost and something that Joe Lieberman represented for four terms in the United States Senate. And we'll talk about some of that tonight. Um, uh, you know, the, the, this is his style of leadership and governance is really what's really missing now. It's the, the style of civility and, and moderation, the willingness to compromise, pragmatism. Uh, here's something, a dignified composure. Uh, with very little hysteria. That was very much represented Joe Lieberman for all those years in public life. Um, he never allowed partisan politics to get in the way of principle. He never allowed his relationship to his party uh, to uh, somehow prevent the passing of legislation. Uh, he was not obstructionist in any way or rancorous. Uh, he, he always seemed to embody and what the goodwill that emanated from him was simply serving the public good. This book is a personal memoir. It's a political memoir. I would say it's a work of political philosophy. You could say it's a, a, a political policy manual. I can tell you that last night, if you were watching the movie channel, uh, there was an interesting coincidence. Uh, Frank Capra's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington oh, was just... the spring. <laughs> and I couldn't help but think, Joe, that you have had not just, you've had a, a Capra-esque life, a wonderful life of your own. Uh, an observant Jew grows up in Connecticut, influenced by John F. Kennedy, a Roman Catholic, and wants to be a United States Senator from Connecticut. And that is his dream. And he gets a chance to actually live out his dream for four terms and beyond his dreams, a vice presidential candidate uh, in the year 2000. Um, and so yes, Mr. Lieberman goes to Washington as well in this, and we'll talk about the, that, that entire career. If, um, if you're watching us uh, live on, on YouTube, we're welcome. Make sure you go to folks.org and uh, sign up for our future, for our email list for future events. Uh, if you have a question for Joe, go to the Q&A box, and hopefully we'll get through that at some point tonight. Joe, let's begin by welcoming you. Thank you for being our guest. Hey, thank uh, uh, Great to do it. We've been talking about doing this uh, for year, years, I think, but uh, <laughs> really that introduction was worth coming on. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your kind evaluation of my career. It's, it's well, really, good to be, really good to be with you. Well, thank you, Joe. I, you've, you've always been not just a friend, but a, a true inspiration and, and a hero. And you're modest enough that you list your heroes in this book as well. I really thought that there was something very modest about the way the numbers of many people that you acknowledged who had such a huge influence in, in, your, in your career and in your public life. So I think the first thing I should do is thank you for your service to this country, uh, because I think that is something that is very well deserved. Well, it was an honor, and, I, and that's not just a political statement. It was, as you said, uh, a dream that uh, sort of built in me slowly over, over um, my earlier life, such that um, w when I left law school, if uh, somebody had stopped me and said, hey, Joe, what, what's your dream? What do you want to be in life? I wouldn't have answered the question because it was too right. presumptuous. The, the answer was... I dream of being a U.S. senator. Now, probably part of that was because uh, Abe Ribicoff, who was a senator from Connecticut, right. was a hero and a mentor of mine. And uh, I worked for him a couple of summers. 
Um, but anyway, and, and he, I, I, I got and, to live and, the dream, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you make that very clear in the book so movingly. So let me start off by reading a quote from the book. Okay. Because uh, I think it embodies a lot of what the, the book is about. Apparently, when uh, Barack Obama just took the, entered the White House, he reached out to you almost immediately. Uh, and because he was planning uh, health care reform, which eventually became the Affordable Care Act, he knew you were a veteran of health care reform that unfortunately failed during the Clinton administration. He thought right. he could get some advice from a seasoned United States senator mm -hmm. for whom health care mattered. Uh, and so apparently when you gave him advice, you said, here's some advice that I got from the failed attempt in the Clinton administration. And you said, it is better to bring opponents inside your tent than to leave them outside where they will attack you. Yeah. That's a great quote. And I wonder whether it also speaks to the premises of the book of bipartisan centrism and also Jewish, you know, it's very biblical, Abraham welcoming strangers in his tent. <laughs> <laughs> your, your interpretation is magnificent. <laughs> And it goes beyond what I had in my mind, but I appreciate it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it is it really at the essence of, of the, um, the theme of the book, but it's a little different um, uh, in terms of bringing your opponents in, into the tent. But I had gone through the, the attempt by the president and Mrs. Clinton to uh, adopt health care reform at the beginning of their administration in the, in the 90s. And... Basically, they shut out the health insurance, the medical profession, the drug companies, and they ended up um, really uh, attacking what uh, Hillary Clinton recommended, and, and they, they did it in. It was just not po possible. So uh, impossible that President Clinton just pulled it back and never let it came, come the to a vote. The, dif the difference, Joe, is that that was a lesson that you walked away from, and I'm, I don't know whether Hillary Clinton walked away with the same lesson, right? That for you, you're obviously always paying attention because clearly it left an impression on you. It did, it did leave an impression. I thought that was the best advice I could give uh, the new president, uh, Barack Obama. Uh, I must say that he's smart enough that, uh, and he had Rahm Emanuel, a former member of the House of Representatives as his chief of staff, that they might've done this anyway. <laughs> I hope my advice helped them, uh, but they did well, do it. And it's part of why uh, they were able to adopt health care reform in America, which presidents had been uh, fighting for since Harry Truman. Uh, yeah, but, you know, but, but the anecdote is, is even runs even deeper. Why? Well, for one thing, you supported your buddy John McCain in that election. Yeah. Right. So Barack Obama obviously didn't hold any grudges against you. He had reached out to you when he was still a senator. And in your book, you say that you advised him to run. You suggested yes. he run. And then you eventually supported a Republican. A, a, you reached across the aisle and right. you did something that almost never happens. A Democrat campaigned actively with a Republican. And the winner, Barack Obama, uh, in his early days, called mm -hmm. you and said, I could use you. I've got a lot of legislative am ambitions here and I need you. He didn't hold any grudges. This is a perfect exam example of the kind of cohesion, political cohesion that is lacking in our country. It, that's a very good example. And uh, I, I give all the credit to Barack Obama. We were friends and he asked me to be one of his mentors when he came into the Senate. As you, as you said, he came to me, uh, it was probably oh, late 06, maybe, and, and said he was thinking about running for president. What did I think? And I urged him to do it. Um, uh, he's, I said, you're a young man. Maybe it's not going to work out, but more people will get to know you, and, and you can do it next time or, or the time after. But, of course, he, he won. And I will tell you this. Uh, it's a long story, but I, 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 in the election to the Senate of 2006, I lost the Democratic nomination. I ran as an independent. No, we're definitely going to get to that. Oh, okay, <laughs> fortunate enough to win. But then John McCain was my dear buddy. Uh, and uh, he uh, asked me if I would support him before the New Hampshire primary where independents could vote because he said, you're Mr. Independent. And I, and I did. And uh, he, he ultimately ended up being nominated. But after that election, 
some of my colleagues in the Democratic Senate caucus actually tried to uh, deny me my seniority to yeah. punish me for There's supporting a- McCain. But here's the point. Um, w- when Obama heard that, the new president-elect, like two or three days after the election, he, he directed his White House spokesperson to put out a statement saying that he didn't believe in political revenge and that yeah. uh, he wanted there to be, there, there had to be room in the Senate Democratic Caucus for Joe Lieberman. Now that meant a lot to me and, and it was in my mind and heart when he called me in uh, to talk about uh, health care reform. And look, I was for it, I wanted it to happen, but I also came in with a, a, a natural human sense of gratitude toward him because if, if he had turned on me after that election, the vote uh, uh, to, to remove me from the caucus essentially would have been a lot closer. Anyway. But, but, um, but imagine, think about again, the, the mutual respect and the civility that mm-hmm. is apparent in that story. He didn't say to you, Joe, you're the one that told me to run for president. Yeah. I, re- I relied on you. You know, I relied on you. And now you're, you're actually supporting not only my challenger, but you're supporting yeah. a Republican. And yet, no grudges. And, you know, the reason this is important is because in our present day political culture, and that's what I really want to get to, yeah. the political culture in which we are today, it's all about energizing and galvanizing the base appeasing the base, whether it's Black Lives Matter or gender identity or, or Magna, MAGA or January 6th insurrection or the Green right. New Deal. And so one wonders, in your book you're saying, these are all wonderful anecdotes by Senator Lieberman of things that worked through compromise, negotiation, willingness to settle, civility, mutual respect. Your career epitomized this concept but you're no longer in public life, right? And so, and I, and other than, you know, this is why this book is so important because people aren't pounding on the desk and saying, why aren't there more Joe Liebermans? Why aren't we having relationships that right. he was able to cultivate with a Susan Collins, with an Arlen Specter, you know, right. the, 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 I'm afraid a number of people who are watching don't remember what it means to be a Scoop Jackson Democrat or Rockefeller Republican. So today it's all about this this polarization. But the interesting thing, your book says that even though that's maybe the impulse that the culture is, it's centrism that actually wins elections and passes legislation. So don't these people get it? Don't they realize that they're just headed for defeat? Yeah, they don't get it. And part of it is that they get um, uh, frightened, I'm afraid, by the, uh, the, the marginal groups in each party, left on Democrats, right and Republicans, and, and the incumbents are, tend to be afraid that if, if they displease those groups, uh, they might not get nominated. And as you know, in a lot of states, certainly in most House districts, the nomination is the election. And so, but what's lost in that is what, what, what should be the first responsibility of anybody elected to serve the public. And I'm not being naive here. It's just, it's part, it's what, what our constitution says, what the oath that we take, the country comes first, not your party and not the certainty of your own reelection. I mean, I, I used to say to people at the end of um, colleagues in Congress, uh, I said, I don't wanna be preaching, but at the end of your career, when you leave office, it, do you wanna just look back and say, I did whatever I had to do to get reelected, and I got reelected three, four, five times. Did you do anything that you really (laughs) believe in? Uh, No. So, uh, or you want to say, I took some risks. I stood for some things that I thought were best for the country that I believed in. Uh, I made some people unhappy, but I joined with people in the other party and got things done. That's a better way to look back at your career. Incidentally, what I say in the book, as you know, thing is that this is the way, the only way really our democracy works. And that goes way back to the Constitutional Convention. People have to, one, um, have a common first priority, which is what's best for the country. And and then they have to be willing to be civil with one another, come to the center 
and talk, negotiate, and then compromise. Don't compromise your ethics but, or, or your morality, but compromise how much you want to get on a particular bill. If you, if you only will settle for 100%, usually you're going to end up with 0%, and, and so um, will the country. And that's what I try to both tell stories to prove not so far, far back, that's exactly what's happened in our government. It's what I was privileged to be involved in some uh, big cases. And it's what we've got to return to, to, to get our government working again, and frankly, to unify the country again. Because today, the politicians of both parties are, are seizing on the division, right. making it worse, and therefore making exploiting it and, and therefore making the country more divided. And, it, you know, somebody said to me just today um, I, that he said to his wife this morning, I feel like we live in two countries, not one. Yeah. Uh, there's a blue and a, and a red America. And of course, what so, I'm saying in the book is there's most people are in the middle, the purple right. America. And, and, and when, when we talk about your, your last election run as an independent, that right. proves it, really. And we'll talk about that later, okay, about how ahead. that actually was an example of that. By the way, in listening to what you just said, Joe, you can see that my anecdote about Mr. Smith goes to Washington is absolutely apt and correct here, because what you're describing is exactly what that movie is about, right? Yeah. About the, the cynicism of why did you come to Washington? Did you yeah. come to Washington to get elected or did you come to do the public good? And that's the message of the movie. And it was the message of your career in public life. But let that's me ask lovely. you this. I, I never thought I'd be compared to Mr. Smith. This, this is really... <laughs> yeah, and, no, but, but you've you know also what? had a, 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 like another... It's Frank been a Cameron. wonderful life. It's, really. another, it's a wonderful life. But you've had another, uh, another Frank Capra-esque experience and a total, an, an, a, a great American story, political story. Mm. Really? Um, but, but when you said before, I'm not naive, I wonder though, and you described what the, the impulse is, right? Everybody is re reaching out. They don't want to be, I think the term of art that they're using now is be primary, right? Right, uh, right? right. They're afraid of people running against them from the left, the fringes. By the way, we, once we had Eric Cantor as our guest, and I said to him, invoking your buddy, John McCain, I said to Cantor, he was going to be Speaker of the House. And I said right. to him, you know, John McCain, who's a Republican, just said the Tea Party people are a bunch of nuts. I think that's <laughs> something John said. And yeah. I said, how do you feel about that? Right. Yeah, well, you know what Eric Cantor said? Oh, no, they're patriotic Americans. And a year later, he lost to a Tea Party. To the person. Tea Party people. Yeah, Which... so it was, it was ironic. So, but what I'm wondering is, is, it rep is what we're seeing a broader problem? It's beyond winning elections, that there's a kind of erosion of institutional norms, right? Uh, yes. Social cohesion. I mean, I'm thinking of just what happened this week, right? The leaking of a Supreme Court decision. Right, right. Uh, January 6th, storming the Capitol, uh, beheading statues, tearing down statues, setting fire to police cars and police precincts, attacking comedians. Apparently yeah. a comedian, Dave Chappelle was attacked last night at the Hollywood Bowl, uh, yeah. censoring politicians, that maybe what we're really facing is something even broader than politics, that, that the concept of coming together in a bipartisan, in the spirit of collegiality has just somehow been lost. And I'm wondering, as now an observer, is that what you're seeing and why? What changed? Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Saint. Uh, and not one that's focused on. Usually when uh, people are asked, how did we get so politically divided? They'll, they'll point to gerrymandering, right. money in politics. Well, all of that is relevant. But uh, in a democracy, politics tends to reflect what's happening uh, out among the, the, the public. And uh, I will go back to what I said before. Unfortunately, in our time, uh, too many politicians in both parties exploit what's happening in, in, out in our culture. This is really cultural and make it worse and make the division worse. So, so what am I talking about? Some of the, 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 the basic values of the country uh, have, have been overrun. 
And it's, uh, it, there are various reasons for it. I mean, the, in some ways, the entertainment culture uh, helped to bring that about because of the decline of, of uh, standards and what, and, and including television. By the way, that's in your book also. It, you, it took is, a, you, know, you took a position on that long yeah. before this became an issue. You were way ahead of the culture on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I may seem like antiquated, but, you know, <laughs> I grew up uh, in a time when there was something called a family hour on television. So uh, parents knew that they could let their kids watch TV with them. And because of self-discipline uh, by the uh, TV networks, uh, the kids would not uh, see anything violence or sexual that the parents didn't uh, want them to see. And that's all out the window now. Part of it happened because of the advent of cable television and the fact that on cable you could say or do whatever you wanted because you didn't have to meet FCC uh, standards. And uh, it's not only that, though. Uh, for a lot of reasons, people are just not civil with one another. And, you know, one of the lessons that I learned, uh, probably pretty obvious, it, let's take the U.S. Senate. Big headlines, big debates, great, great issues. But in another sense, the U.S. Senate is 100 people going to work in the same place every day. And your ability to get on with your colleagues, the 99 other, to, to, uh, to, to have a comfortable relationship with them, uh, hopefully to build up a relationship of trust, uh, that, uh, that is, is a very important factor in your ability then to sit down with them and to uh, negotiate the kind of compromises that I talked about before that really produce the kind of change that people want to solve people's problems or take advantage of opportunities. I do want to make one quick point that comes to mind in this. When I, when I use the term centrism, uh, I define it in the book as quite different from moderation. Uh, centrism is when Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives come to the center and, and talk civilly to one another, negotiate, compromise, get something done. And I use two examples. Um, one is Teddy Kennedy, who everybody would say was a liberal Democrat, which he was. And you could take John McCain or Orrin Hatch, let's say, it was in my mind because he just passed away. Conservative Republican. And it's good to take those two. Because those two, when they, when they had a common goal to get a piece of legislation adopted, they would come to the center and, and negotiating and get it done. And uh, they did some health insurance before Obama did. They did a children's health insurance uh, bill. They did the Americans with Disabilities Act. I mean, they were great social advances, but they, they, they were done only because they both came to the but center. But, and they both had bipartisan support. But it also is because they came, what I think I hear you saying is, they came to the table willing to compromise. Correct. Right? That they understood that that's part of what has to happen. Um, because <clears throat> uh, you point out in the book, it, the book is just wonderful and explaining that's a really good anecdote of Ted Kennedy, but Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich, right? right. Examples of people who wanted to get something done. And of course, I love the use of Voltaire because what you point out with Voltaire is that, I think you say the good is the enemy of the perfect, which means if you're only looking for the perfect- The you perfect never... is the enemy of the good. Oh, you the know, other way around. I, I, I can't tell you how often I heard that over the years from politicians. Which, so, but the, but the point is, just explain it. You're saying that yeah. we accepting good is okay instead of looking only, demanding perfection. Right, so I, first off, I wanna say that at one point a few years ago, I just thought, I wonder where that expression came from. And I looked it up and I thought, oh my goodness, Voltaire, pretty good provenance for a quote. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but, but Joe, I just want to say, I just want to say, because it's important that two buddies say that to each other, Voltaire was an anti-Semite. I'm just Yeah, wondering. all right, well, <laughs> I'll leave that aside. For just leaving that aside. <laughs> no, he was, you're right. So what did he mean when he said the perfect, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good? Meaning if, you're, if you will only accept the perfect in the legislative context and negotiations, you're, you're gonna get nothing. Uh, the alternative is to compromise and yeah. accept the less than 100% of what you want 
and you can get something very good. And I, and the different circumstances that I tell the, the environment, the clean air act. Yeah. Uh, balance, I have a list. Look, yeah. the clean air act, the balanced budget of 1999, the military response in the Balkans. This is all in your book as examples of centrism, the right. repeal of don't ask, don't tell. It goes right. on and on. The passage of no child left behind. The stimulus package in response to the 2008 recession. Yeah. Obamacare, right. the, the military uh, authorization in the Gulf War. And of yeah. course, all the accomplishments of the Clinton administration. You say all of that are, are, are res what's responsible is centrism. And then you're, so I think you're saying the reason we don't see any legislative accomplishments anymore is because there's no willingness to achieve compromise. That's right. And uh, people are feeding more, more off of, in a sense, their own self-righteousness, the perfection uh, of their point of view that they, they, they insist on. But frankly, they're also playing to the fringes, the so-called core constituency in their uh, party. And they're forgetting... Uh, what's good for the country. And frankly, they're forgetting most of all uh, that the people who need government to get something done on some of these problems, and, and if the uh, uh, members of Congress and the president just posture and demand 100%, demand perfection, the people end up with nothing. And it's only one of the consequences of that, which we have now, uh, the public is angry at the government. They don't yeah. trust the government. Right. And uh, that's not healthy in our democracy. So so but but what but but again goes back to what's in the broader culture. Incivility is the new normal. Right. Right. I mean, in, in a, in a, at some point, I'm going to ask you about your debate with Dick Cheney in 2000 and how that contrasted from the debates with Biden and Trump. It's a shocking, in my view, your debate with Cheney should be used in civics before elections. The whole country should just watch it as a reminder of what it should look like before we do it next week. This is what it looked like 22 years ago. Yeah. These guys didn't agree on anything, but the mutual respect, the civility, let's try to return to something that is dignified. But we're living in a time where incivility is the new normal and where compromise is an anathema and everyone believes in zero sum thinking. Whatever is good for you would make me miserable. <laughs> Correct. You know, no, like, that's true. Right. The fellow said to me today, the country is two countries opposing each other. And I said that the, the, one of the worst parts of it is if, if one part of the country says A, the other part is going to automatically say no, not A, even if they don't know about it. And that's, that's foolish, uh, but it's also uh, bad for the country. So one of the things that I got out of the book, many things, uh, it's again, great read, really interesting, touching in many places. Here's something that I found touching. And I hope you don't think I'm exaggerating, but I, I read this book as Valentine might not be the right word, but surely a validation, a tribute to the Clinton administration. I think that you have an enormous amount of respect for the accomplishments. You were a senator at the time. He was your law school classmate. And you, re you remind the country in this book, balanced the budget, ran a surplus, uh, all budget reform, welfare reform, crime control, crime bill, booming economy, extraordinary right. raising of economic opportunity. It is in many ways a tribute to the Clinton administration, your old friend. And yet, and yet people still remember that you were an outspoken critic as a Democrat in his impeachment trial and wanted, voted, wanted, supported censuring the president, right. even though, even though at that time you credited him with all of this. And again, that just shows a kind of a complexity that is, is very much missing. You said that story about who you spoke to today. If I want B, then I hate B. And in your case, you're saying both things can happen at the same time. I, yeah. can think, I can think Clinton was one of the great presidents in American history, and I can also be mortified by the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I did think, I mean, I did know Clinton. I was one of his earlier uh, supporters. Uh, he had a vision, and it really was a, a centrist vision. And uh, Is that what they mean by the word triangulation? <laughs> in a way, in a way. Is that what it is? That, I'm just curious. 
Well, yeah, yeah it, it, it began to be uh, diminished and, and criticized, but triangul triangulation really is a way of bringing people of different points of view to the center and finding common ground so you can get something done. When, when Newt Gingrich and the Republicans took over the House in 1994 election, um, uh, the, the general feeling was that nothing was going to get done in the government. But, but Clinton reached out to Gingrich. And unlike some of those earlier pairs, like Reagan and Tip O'Neill, who liked each other, sat in the White House, had drinks, told jokes, these two, Clinton and Gingrich, no way. But you know what? They were both policy wonks. And Clinton engaged Gingrich. Gingrich began to take him seriously. And they reached a political truth, which is that both of them had made promises to their respective constituencies, even though they, uh, Gingrich's was on the right, Clinton's was center left, that they were going to get certain things done. And they both came to the understanding, Clinton and Gingrich, that they couldn't get anything done unless they were working together. So they worked together. And uh, I, I agree with you. I think Clinton's presidency was one of, one of the most productive in American history. So let's go back to that courageous stand that you took uh, in the Senate during his impeachment uh, trial. I have a funny little anecdote that I'm gonna read to you. Um, um, we, uh, within weeks of when you were nominated to become vice president with uh, Al Gore in that election in 2000, so this was August 13th of 2000. So you can almost imagine that summer of you on the campaign trail. By the way, the book is great in following you on that campaign trail. You told some really great stories are very entertaining, well-written, but fun to read as a reminder of what it's like to be on the trail, on a bus, on a plane, you know, on your way to, to campaign and never sleeping the whole time. So there was a story in the New York Times on August 13th, 2000, about your wife, Hadassah. And it was about her being a child of Holocaust survivors. It was, that was entirely about her. It had nothing to do with you. He's saying, this is the woman who would be the, the second woman of the United States conceivably. And I was reminded of this in reading the book because I'm gonna read you a section from that, uh, from that article. And it says this, knowledge of genocide is in the genes. And this is referring to Hadassah being a child of survivors. Said Thane Rosenbaum, <laughs> A survivor, oh, look at them. a survivor's son and author of Secondhand Smoke and other Holocaust-themed novels. Then it goes on to say, I'm quoted, there is a kind of moral imperative that children of survivors have about speaking out, not being silent, not falling prey to the language of indifference. When I heard Hadassah Lieberman was a child of survivors, I wondered whether she influenced her husband speaking out in the Monica Lewinsky case. So I thought there's a great little tie-in with Monica Lewinsky. But, I, but the truth is, Bill, uh, Joe, when I think of Clinton and that example, there were many examples, the Balkans, uh, your vote, repeated vote to support the troops in Iraq. You took a number of positions on principle, some of which hurt you politically, right. and yet you kept standing up for what you thought was right and was what wasn't politically expedient, including, you know, speaking out against your your law school buddy. I think yeah. this is an important thing. I'm I'm not crediting necessarily the fact that you married a child of Holocaust survivors, but I'm wondering. It's obviously in you somehow because you did it repeatedly. Well, uh, you know, like like most Jews, the Holocaust uh, uh, is a, a painful. A part of history, but also a powerful influence on me. But there's no question about it, thing that it became just much more personal, intense as a result of my marriage to Hadassah. You mean the the, the 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 Bosnian genocide, for instance? Yeah, yeah. So you know, I, and it's interesting how this turned about because I was, of course, studying the Second World War, the Shoah, the Holocaust. Um, how 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 painful it was to see how long it took countries uh, to come to the uh, to come into the fight against Nazism, and how much we have to be grateful uh, to Churchill for it because he, for a while, was alone there. And I, you know, when we say never again, that was in my mind. And uh, ironically, of course, when you say never again, it doesn't mean just toward Jews. 
So when, when I uh, came in in, um, in 1989 to the Senate, I mean, the first uh, public uh, um, exposure I had really uh, at, at, in foreign policy was in supporting the effort to get uh, Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, which in some sense, uh, I'm borrowing from somebody else uh, who wrote recently that that was the last time one nation invaded another nation until Putin just took Russia uh, into Ukraine. But then uh, the Serbian uh, dictator uh, Milosevic uh, started a campaign of aggression against Bosnia, a Muslim country, and, and really genocide. And to me, okay, the people there were, were, were Muslim, um, but uh, it was happening again. And I felt yeah. a, a powerful um, uh, drive that I had to do something about it. I had wonderful bipartisan colleagues who, who I worked with, Bob Dole, John McCain, Joe Biden. But and you me. were very, but you were very junior at the time, right? I was. I mean, that's I what's was. very interesting that you, you did seem to take a leadership role. You know, there was a little chutzpah there that you stepped in. Everyone was a little, and I think I would say ambivalent, you know, including yeah. President Clinton. I think right. Tony Blair was pushing President Clinton. And I think you from Connecticut were pushing on your side a little. Yeah, no, it, it did. I like the idea. It did take some chutzpah, but I was I was agitated by what was happening, and I, I what and I thought it was not only important of itself to stop aggression and genocide in Europe, but this was a a, a test after the end of the Cold War whether Europe was going to go back into in rivalries between nations without uh, regard to any standards and. Uh, in the end, um, we convinced Clinton to take action, both there and in Kosovo, and uh, the Serbian aggression and genocide uh, stopped. But there's no question that the, the, the Holocaust experience and uh, my wife and, and the, the intimacy of that with her parents both being survivors, both losing most of their family during the Holocaust, uh, so had a, a direct effect on me. So let's look, look at another piece of Hadassah's life and your Jewish experience. Yeah. I think people, and in the book, you say this very plainly. When you were nominated to become vice president, you were known as not just Jewish, but an observant Jew. And there were all sorts of questions. You know, wh what will happen on Shabbos? Will Lieberman right. not be vice president? And you say in the book that it was, I think most people were surprised you never faced any anti-Semitism or any bigotry. And in fact, your observance of Judaism actually helped the ticket in a way. Can you talk a little about that? Because, yeah. and the reason I, I want you to talk about that is because then I want you to finish up by saying, if you were running today, do you think you would have had the same response? Because I'm not sure you would. It's a really important question. I've thought about it. So, um, it was a remarkable experience in 2000. And I will tell you what, I tell the story in the book, I'll do it quickly, that on the, on the night that they flew my family and me to Nashville, so the vice yeah. president would yeah. announce the next day yeah. that uh, I was his choice for running mate. And the funny part was my mother was there and she walked, she had the walker and she was short, looked up at Al and said, Mr. Vice President, you really made a right choice. You know, <laughs> can't control a Jewish mother. Um, but Al Gore said to me that night that he had decided about two weeks before that I was his first choice, but he really felt he had a responsibility to talk to a small group of friends who he trusted uh, to say, do you think having a Jewish person on the national ticket will make it impossible for us to win? Fascinating responses, you may remember. He said, uh, some of the Jews I spoke to, my Jewish friends, were nervous. A couple of them told me, please don't do it. And every one of my Christian friends uh, who are uh, uh, counselors said, there's no problem, uh, no problem at all. And so I've decided to go ahead and, and, and that I could do what I wanted to do and make you my running mate. So that was, and Al understood. He said, you know, there's a difference between the fear of anti-Semitism among Jews, which he understood was based on Jewish history. And the reality of anti-Semitism among non-Jews, mostly Christians in America, but which is just different. Now, so I, as I said, and you 
were kind enough to quote, I didn't face any anti-Semitism uh, during the 2000 campaign. And look, the, 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 you know, after sports and, and elections are similar. It all comes down to the numbers. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, there is an electoral college in presidential right. elections, but it's a, it's a wonderful statement about America that the first time there was a Jewish person on a national ticket, that ticket got 545,000 more votes than the other ticket. So th that's a victory in a way. Um, well, you, you describe it as br breaking down of a barrier. Yeah, I, I, I certainly hope and pray it was. I, I believe it was now. Um, now, now, right. Now we know there's rising, uh, alarming right. rising incidents of anti-Semitism yeah. globally so, and in the United States. Yeah. Uh, you've got so, so, a, the Democratic Party is very progressive now, and it oftentimes doesn't seem to have much room for Jews or, Jew yeah. or ethnicity. I'm curious, how do you feel today? OK, so I would always say to people about 2000, I didn't experience any anti-Semitism, but please understand uh, I know that there are anti-Semites out there. They're all, it's always true. It's a minority of people in this country, thank God. But the prevailing ethic, 2000, was made it unacceptable for them to come out of their caves or from under the rocks. Now, now today, for all the reasons we've said, the, the, the incivility, the attack, counterattack uh, politics, the, the, the uh, lack of discipline in speech by... Uh, public officials has, and the internet has uh, uh, unleashed these anti-Semites to come out from under the rock. Now, now, do I think that that would affect a Jewish candidate on a national ticket? I, I, my answer is I hope not, because I, I believe and I see this, but it would be tougher, and the anti-Semitism would be uh, more overt than anything I faced in 2000. But if you look at the polling, uh, the American people are still very open to a Jewish candidate or other minorities uh, to, to uh, be president or, or vice president. And, well, you know, and you were treated with a great deal of respect in 2000. And I think it, it, to me, looking back on it, it was unimaginable that anyone would publicly you know, you th throw an egg at Joe Lieberman, you know, right. like I, and now I fear that, as you said, there is a breakdown, erosion of institutional norms and civility. And, you know, if comedians are going to be attacked on stage, you know, right. why not a Jewish candidate for vice president? So let's yeah. speak about the, that, can, that, can, that election. Let, I want to go back to that debate. Uh, were you surprised that you and Cheney, did you speak to each other beforehand and said, hey, Dick, let's do this like men, like men. Let's do this like honorable men. I mean, or was it just something that naturally happened where two men who don't agree on anything could sit there? You, I remember you were chuckling with each other. Yeah. There was a little ribbing, but it was all good natured and very substantive, incredibly substantive. It really was a class in civics. You could have learned a lot from that debate. And thank, today thank. that debate is unimaginable. I, I agree. I, I'm very proud of that debate. Now, part of it was that Dick Cheney and I knew each other. I mean, we're not best friends, but he had been uh, Secretary of Defense under President Bush 41. I was on the Armed Services Committee, so we naturally uh, got to know each other. We, we worked together on, on a lot of uh, matters. And it basically, he's a serious guy. He, he has a definite opinion on things, but, but he's not a nasty person. And uh, I think that all uh, came out uh, during the debate. Um, I, I will tell you that we were both lucky in a funny way, because you always, you, you know, when you prepare for this, uh, you're ready, you have to defend your candidate for president, who uh, the assumption is the other candidate for vice president will attack your running mate. But uh, Bush and Gore had had a debate a couple of nights before, and they were brutal with each other. Yeah. And the polling said that the public was really turned off by it. So in a way... Uh, Bo, and, and Dick Cheney and I talked after the election about this and got a laugh out of it. The po our, both of our pollsters, Republican and Democrat, said to us, you know what, um, have the kind of debate you want to have. You don't feel, don't feel obliged to attack each other or the presidential candidates. So well, It's also what a centrist would do, right? Yeah. A centrist would look at the field and say, what happened two nights ago was not good. 
right? Maybe there's right. another way to do this that could be right. better. Right. So, and the reaction to it was really great and very gratifying. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I hope people do study it someday. But, you know, that relate. I think of it in a way, it jump started a relationship that continued into the Bush administration because they relied on you a great deal uh, to establish the home after 9 11, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, to establish the 9-11 commission to investigate uh, how the failure, the breakdown of our uh, intelligence agencies, you were at the very center of those post 9-11 initiatives and you were a Democrat at the time. Right. And I th what's interesting, and that's why I'm gonna get us back into your last election, that those examples of bipartisanship and pragmatism and compromise for the public good in the service of the nation that had just been attacked grievously in ways never before, and that you answered the call. And you know what, Joe? You paid a price. Your, yeah. party, your party punished you for supporting the Iraq war, and you yeah. had to run as an independent. In the book, I hope you'll talk about this now, you talked about that was the most bitter defeat that your right. party rejected you. And then you, the best defeat, the best victory you ever achieved is when you ran as an independent in that same election and picked off enough votes of Republicans and Democrats and actually sailed to victory. Yeah, so uh, it, it was a remarkable turn of events because you know I didn't know George Bush um, until after election day in 2000, I never met him. Uh, but it turned out that I was the ranking Democrat or the chairman on then called the Government Affairs Committee, and we got the, uh, later called the Homeland Security Committee, we got responsibility for creating the Department of Homeland Security, and I co-sponsored that bill with our own inspector of blessed memory that you talked about. Uh, John McCain and I worked on the 9-11 Commission, Susan Collins, John McCain and I and others worked on adopting that legislation. And I will say that uh, the nation, uh, after all, had been attacked on 9-11, it was a trauma, and that was one case where we pulled together. There were real debates during the consideration of the post 9-11 legislation, but they weren't partisan. They were really about turf. A certain number of uh, federal agencies did not want to be combined in the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, Don Rumsfeld didn't want the uh, intelligence assets of the Pentagon, including under a new director of national intelligence. But but we worked it out and it was it was just the right thing for the country. Honestly, if you ask me, as sometimes people do, what I think was the, the accomplishment that makes me the proudest where I feel, if you will, that I did the most for my country, it was that legislation uh, after 9-11. It was just an honor to be there and to work with the people I worked with. But here, Joe, is an area where hopefully your biographers are not gonna miss this, which is that there were within a short period of time from 19, uh, from 2001 to 2008, 2001 and 2000, it's just seven years apart. The nation had two major traumas. One was 9-11, the other was the 2008 financial collapse that led right. to the Great Recession. Right. You played a key role in both of those traumas in the legislation that was ultimately used to remedy and respond to that. Yeah. I think that that, that that must be said, Joe. I feel, I feel an obligation to say that. Thank you. I, I I'm, really, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful that you said it. I'm very proud that I had that chance. You know, when it came to the, when uh, uh, President Obama came into office, he really wanted to go to healthcare reform first, but the economy was in a dive and he had to go to this economic recovery bill. And I'll never forget, uh, Harry Reid, the majority that had called me up and he said, uh, we're gonna need three Republican votes to pass this bill that we need to, to save the country economically. And these are three of your friends, Joe, uh, Susan Collins, Olympia Snow, the other Senator from Maine and Arlen Specter of Pennsylvania, three moderate Republicans, uh, President Obama and, and I need your help. And the president called me after said the same thing and I was really thrilled to work on it because um, we got their votes and, and that bill passed. And I think that's part of why we came out of that great recession as effectively as we did. Um, 
talk a little about, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. This has been a breezy 45 uh -huh. minutes and, uh -huh. and, 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 very, and, and super fun. You're a tremendous guest and always so charming and courtly. It's not surprising that you were able to reach across the aisle so successfully all those years. Um, uh, no labels. Yeah. It seems like something now, this seems like something that you would want to get involved in. Uh, tell the uh, audience what it is. And, and you know, I, I look at this and say, one of our board chairs is, by the way, a member of No Labels, Joe Feshback. Um, sure. But I, I can tell you uh, that, you know, I think this, the political cynics looking at the landscape will say, oh, that'll never work. You know, yeah. but I'm curious whether you say, look, you know what? I can teach you how this yeah. can work. Yeah. So tell us it, a little about it. It's working. So th this organization was really started by a, a woman named Nancy Jacobson, uh, who had been a, a basically a Democratic political consultant fundraiser for a lot of years. And she just got fed up with the partisanship and thought she wanted to do something, uh, to try to do something to improve it. So she formed No Labels in 2010. I, I supported it from the beginning, but I really was in the Senate. And so I didn't do that much work on it. When I came out in 2013, it was one of the things I wanted to do, which is to see what I could do out of the Senate to, to try to undercut the partisanship and reunite people in Congress and the president at the center. And so to me, No Labels was the best idea around. And I joined it in 2013, became the co-chair of 2014, always bipartisan, first co-chair with John Huntsman, the Republican governor of Utah, former, when he left to become ambassador to Russia, uh, Larry Hogan, the Republican governor of, of Maryland, has been the co-chair. But the whole idea uh, is uh, how do we get Democrats and Republicans back to the center to work together? We started by just convening Democrats and Republicans in the House to talk about issues, which they weren't doing at all. The two parties were separate. And uh, uh, then we gave them specific ideas uh, of things that we had polled and they were popular with Republicans, Democrats, independents. And, and then we, we made a, a, a big decision, which is that a big part of what was scaring members of Congress was money, that if they stepped out on their own and worked uh, with members of the other party, their party and interest groups would not support them. And we basically said, we're, we're gonna promise you that we have your back. And we started it in 2016, then 2018, supporting members of Congress in both parties who had proven that they really were centrist in the way we're talking about. And after 2018, we ended up starting a caucus, which has now taken off on its own, called the House Problem Solvers Caucus. 58 <laughs> members, bipartisan, equal number of both. We call it the Noah's Ark rule. You can't come in unless you get somebody from the other party. Uh, to, to come in with you two at a time. And in the Senate, uh, Joe Manchin and Susan Collins formed a similar group. It took a little while for senators to come together, but you know what did it? We had the idea, let's hold bicameral meetings. We'll bring our House centrists and Senate centrists together for breakfast or lunch or dinner. And naturally what happened is uh, somebody from the House would be talking about a bill that they've worked on together. And somebody in the Senate would say, gee, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll introduce that in the Senate. So, you know, most recently, it's this group that really uh, initiated the bipartisan infrastructure reform bill, which everybody, including President Biden, says is a major accomplishment. So it, it is working. It is working. It, it really is. And we're, we're very intent on, on protecting uh, the, the problem solvers in the House and Senate in this election. Say, we're, we're different. We're not... Uh, uh, trying to divide people. We're trying to unite people and we're trying to elect people uh, that will work together for the good of the country. And I think we're making progress on it. So let's take some, a few questions from the audience and we'll say good night to Joe. Okay. <clears throat> this comes to us, I'm not sure where he's from, but Keith Long says, with John McCain, one of your best friends and as a strong Democrat politically, please enlighten us with a good answer to this question. This is, this is actually a tough one, Joe. The name Trump provokes a mandatory eye roll and objection by Bush Republicans and Democratic leaders. So right. please say something nice about Trump 
and help bring us together again. So if yeah. you were in, in the spirit of bipartisanship and centrism and compromise and goodwill for the idea of the, you know, even with a, a person who has long demonstrated a sort of a, a boorish incivility, but if one were to reach across the aisle, what would you say to make him think, you know what, Joe Lieberman said something nice about me? <laughs> well, if you just took him on his record and, and, and you could block out his tweets and his comments, which are were so often uh, negative, uncivilized, attacking people, dividing people, uh, uh, not that I agreed with everything he did, I disagreed with a lot, but I agreed with some. And to me, I, I have been really in foreign policy focused on the threat from the Islamic Republic of Iran. I thought the Obama um, European deal with them in 2015 on nuclear weapons was a terrible deal, bad for us, good for them. And we, we were trying to figure out how are we gonna live with it? How are we gonna survive? They're gonna get stronger. They're gonna use the money we gave them to support terrorism. And then Trump gets elected president and lo and behold, he pulls us out of that agreement. I thought that was, that was really an act of courage uh, and, and had a major positive effect. So to me, um, uh, that, that's one a very good thing I would say. Look, I, uh, I, in 1995, Trent Lott and I sponsored a bill uh, to, to move the capital, uh, I'm sorry, to move our embassy in Israel to the capital, Jerusalem. Right. We have our embassy in the capital city of every other country in the world. Uh, except Israel, which is one of our closest allies. And the reason it seemed to be given was that we thought it would create a war uh, with the Arab world. And so we had to put in it to get Bill Clinton to sign it, a waiver to the presidents that they could not implement it if they thought it would compromise the security of the United States. Every president, Republican, Democrat, waived it uh, 20 some odd years later. <laughs> Donald Trump comes along, unconventional, and he says, of course the, our embassy should be in Jerusalem, that there are friends, so we moved it. And, and the, the stunning reality was the reaction from the Arab world was not what anybody predicted. It was basically accepting, not, not I won't say that everybody was jumping up and down happy. The only conflict came when Hamas sent a, a bunch of a terrorist to the border with Israel, and that, that created a minor conflict. Right. But so I, I give I give Trump credit for some big leadership in foreign policy. I, I suppose I could think of other things I, again, and it's happening again with him now as he seems to move back to another presidential run. I I wish he would just focus not on 2020, which he's done that already. Let's go. Let's talk about the future, which is what elections are supposed to be about. All right, we'll take one last question. I think this comes to us from one of our board chairs, Joe Feshbach, who is also okay. a member and who is actually a member of, of No Labels. Yeah, I know I've met Joe through uh, No Labels. He's, he's a wonderful person and been a great uh, force within No Labels. He's gonna love that you said that. Well, <laughs> so it's thank, true. Thank you for that, Joe. I think this is, the question is, the Progressive Caucus is up to 98 members and with redistricting, their numbers could increase while moderate Democrats fight for their survival in the general elections. Is there any hope in the future that the Democratic Party can halt or even reverse their leftward momentum? That's a great question. And really it's the big question for Democrats to decide. I mean, right now, uh, President Biden's uh, public uh, approval numbers are way down. The Democratic Party is down. And I think it's because the the left wing of the Democratic Party has had disproportionate influence on the president's agenda and the Democratic congressional agenda. And it, and it just, it, there's not public support for it. I mean, I think a lot of liberal Democrats felt the fact that Biden beat Trump in 2020 was really a, to, a, a total rejection of uh, conservatism or even centrism. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, uh, the country, if you read the polling and self-identity of it, American people is more conservative than liberal and mostly uh, independent and, and, and moderate. So the party to save itself, which is a panic in the Democratic Party right now, yeah. and it's all around the centrist in those House seats and Senate uh, states who are going to be in trouble in this election because the party is seen 
has so far left. So I, I hope in the months remaining, it's not going to be easy. The President Biden brings the Democratic Party back to the center. And if that doesn't happen, hopefully the Democrats will keep that in mind as they nominate a candidate uh, for president in 2024, if it's not President Biden. I want to say a final word to be provocative. Uh, there's not much history of successful third party candidacies for president in America. I mean, you have to go back to Abraham Lincoln in 1860, really, for the last successful one. Incidentally, a bipartisan ticket as running mate Andrew Johnson was a Democrat governor of Tennessee. I but I, I think if we end up with Trump on the Republican side and a left left candidate on the Democratic side, there, there may be a, a kind of uprising of the broad center, uh, center left, center right, uh, together around what I hope would be uh, a national unity bipartisan ticket. Uh, you know, Jefferson said that every, I forgot, 20 or 25 years, uh, this government of ours should, needs to have a rebellion. And he, he compared it to the, the impact of storms on nature to sort of clear the dead wood out. And I think we're at that point. If the two parties can't do it, then uh, I think there's going to be a rebellion and it's going to lead to a third party, which can change our politics. What, what a great political insight. Unfortunately, we don't have Joe Lieberman to run in that spot. <laughs> no. Uh, but, I, but I might well support it if that's the way it goes. Well, there's no doubt you no doubt you will because you, you've given us the prescription. Everyone buy this book. It's really great. It is an amazingly beautiful read. It's a uh, charming read. It's well written and and um, and and sentimental in the very best way. Uh, you know, th there. This is a you know this is the kind of guy that doesn't really have a negative thing to say. And even mm -hmm. if he does, he does it in a way. <laughs> With real tact and 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 civility, and you get a real sense of him tonight uh, in our conversation, and you'll also get it in the book. Before we say goodnight to Joe, I, we have, I think, a couple quick announcements. Uh, yeah, we have an event next week. Uh, New York Times best-selling writer. Yep, that's right, Rich Cohen. Um, uh, his new book is *The Adventures of Herbie Cohen: The World's Greatest Negotiator*. So, in some ways. Uh, that book is a little related <laughs> to, yes, the cent to the centrist solution. Um, and let's see what else. Uh, make sure, yeah, our audience. Yeah, of course, if you're not already on our mailing list, visit folks.org and that way you'll be aware of all of our future up upcoming events. And of course, we know we're your, we are your favorite nonprofit throughout the pandemic. We have gone virtual and we haven't charged for tickets. So try to remember us uh, because I think what you saw tonight is a yet another example of the folks experience. You saw Joe Lieberman in a very authentic winning way as Joe Lieberman normally does present himself. Um, Joe, I wanna thank you for being such a wonderful friend. I want to thank you for being such a uh, extraordinary public service servant and also for being a national treasure, Joe. I think that's a fair statement. Very kind of you. Thane, it's, it's great to be your friend. And uh, to say the obvious, you represent civility, intelligence, and a, and a real open mind and, and a, a lively mind. And we need more of that uh, well, in our I country. I learned it from you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> have, a, have a great night. And thank okay. you. We'll see, see you soon. I'm Take Thane care. Rosenbaum for folks. Good night, everyone.